There is so much different information and resources out there about the skills you need and what you need to study if you're interested in beginning a career in cybersecurity. But in this video, I bring in the expert, John Hammond, who not only has a very successful YouTube channel here, all based about cybersecurity and the different threats out there. He's also a threat analyst for Huntrust. And of course, we're in the middle of the Bearded IT Dance holiday training giveaway. And Hack the Box has really come through this year and they have actually donated five silver premium annual subscriptes and five $100 gift cards for me to give away to you guys. So make sure you definitely stay tuned until the end because we're gonna tell you how to win that and all the information you need to know coming up. Welcome to the show. Uh, you know, do you want to take a couple minutes and uh, introduce yourself and what you do for a living and why you're such an amazing person in the cybersecurity field? <laughs> oh, well, hey, thank you so much. I, I super appreciate the the warm welcome. This is a ton of fun. I'm super happy to be hanging out with you here. Uh, so, hello, my name is John Hammond. I'm a, uh, I guess, during the day, right, for my day job, I work as a senior security researcher at a company called Huntress. Uh, and on the side, when I can fit in some free time, I try to create content, uh, share educational videos on YouTube for all things cybersecurity, whether it's capture the flag or penetration testing programming, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I host a lot of capture the flag training competitions and exercises and events. So uh, just, <laughs> I don't know, keeping myself busy, running around and having fun. Absolutely. And, you know, I've I've seen that your YouTube channel, you have a massive YouTube channel and a massive follow in there. Uh, and you've done a lot of great. You've spoken at uh, a lot of other YouTuber channels and stuff. Um, you really have a really great knowledge of cybersecurity. And uh, let's dive right on into really what how did you get your start in the cybersecurity field? Oh, well, hey, thanks so much. Uh, I guess I I feel like I, I, I probably grew up sort of, I, I don't know, like an any kid that says, oh, I want to make video games or I want to I want to be a hacker like I've seen in the movies, you know, that Hollywood style that sort of glorifies it and, and glamorizes and everything. Uh, so I went online at some point at some younger age and thought I would Google like, hey, how to be a hacker, <laughs> like type into YouTube or whatever and see what free resources I could find. Because uh, the school that I was attending didn't have anything that was, hey, strictly computer science or strictly cybersecurity. Uh, and somehow, luckily enough, I stumbled across, I think, uh, like Eric S. Raymond's blog, uh, one resource out on the internet that is literally titled how to become a hacker. And I thought, okay, this is cool. Uh, and the, the number one piece of advice that it shared was, Hey, if you want to dive into this thing, you really need to learn how to program, like how to code, how to write scripts and be able to automate processes on your computers and it suggested learning the python language that was beginner friendly hacker friendly easy to read easy to write so i looked for tutorials on that learning python and i don't know it, it, it just sort of was a snowball from there like that was a lot of fun now i want to get in and learn into understanding how Linux works. How could I make a website? What does it, what does it take to run my own server? What's the software technologies, etc. So for the longest time, it was all about building things for me. It was more the creative, Hey, let's make something, I guess, sort of in that software engineering or computer science aspect. Uh, it wasn't until I got into my undergrad, uh, I went over to uh, the United States Coast Guard Academy to kind of, Hey, go get my education there. Uh, and they, didn't have a computer science or cybersecurity track either. <laughs> uh, so it was sort of self-taught <laughs> in the realm of, okay, getting into more of the cybersecurity aspect. Uh, I, I, I had to take electrical engineering courses, which are great, which are wonderful, but all the systems and signal stuff I don't use at all in my day-to-day -day life. Uh, but uh, thankfully there were some cool extracurricular activities that got me into it and really introduced, hey, this is what a vulnerability is, and this is what an exploit is. And they, they framed it in that capture the flag learning environment, but it was really cool because obviously government and military side, they care more about like, hey, is, is, the, is the software that you create secure? Is it safe? Is it stable? Uh, it, can it be battle tested, right? It's not just, can you make something, but can you break something, right? So... 
I'm very much self-taught as well. Um, you know, I, I have kind of a unique story how I got into the field. Nice. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't have any IT certifications. I didn't have a college degree as a college dropout. Um, and before I was in IT, I was a bulldozer operator. I, oh, I wow. came from like the furthest thing you can be from IT. Um, but I was very much self-taught. Um, I always, especially from a young age, I always had to know how, how, how it worked. Um, I was constantly taking apart electronics. Um, you know, I learned, I taught myself how to build websites and that kind of really got my passion going. Um, and then in high school, I was lucky enough, my high school had a CCNA course, nice. uh, which was really cool. And back, back in those days, I feel old saying that, but <laughs> back in those days, it was really, it was absolutely guaranteed job, uh, placement out of the program ccna program you had a ccna you had recruiters calling you like the day after you got your ccna saying hey we got this job are you interested you know nice um so that was really cool um but i lost my way and i focused on you know just doing jobs to put food on the table hence being bulldozer operator and manufacturing jobs but when i decided to get into it one of the things I very much like you, I went out and did the research on what was required to get into IT. And one thing I found out was certifications were super useful. Um, so on your path to getting into IT, did you start studying for any certifications? Did you get any certs before you entered the field or did that come later? Uh, so yes, is really the short answer. Um, I, I, I really enjoy a whole lot of the certification uh, programs and, and, extra, and a lot of those activities Oftentimes when they can put you in like a practical, hands-on, application-based learning environment, that's when I think, hey, this is fun. Like this is testing merit and competency and it's something that I can prove myself with completing whatever capstone challenge or exam. Um, so I, I, I did chase more than a few of those. I think, and I agree with you, there's a huge amount of value in certifications, um, especially, hey, to get the foot in the door, to get into the industry. And you do sort of the... Uh, cost benefit analysis or whatever, or what, what ROI you might think of. Like, okay, if I were to go to some large formal official uh, undergrad or official education institution, right, that could be four years or more at however X, Y, Z thousand dollars, uh, where certifications are significantly less money with significantly less time investment. So, like, okay, <laughs> that sounds Absolutely. great. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, um, that's kind of the way I looked at it. I, I mean, college isn't for everyone, just to be 100% totally. honest. At least, at least that's the way I see it. Um, and then I, I just struggled in an environment where, you know, those IT certifications a lot of time are a lot more laser focused. You know, oh, yeah. you know they, they focus on the certain topic you're learning. And, you know, if you take the right certification, that's obviously the topic you're trying to go, you know, advance your career towards. So, um, but I don't think certifications should make up the total mix of skills when you are learning to get into the field. Certifications are great, um, but I think there's also a thing of too many certifications. I think a lot of people try to get all these certifications before they even try to get their foot in the door and start building experience. Um, what do you have to say to that, you know, that kind of mindset? I'd agree with you there just as well. It is totally a, a certain balancing act. Uh, I think it's funny because I always think of that you, you hear the phrase uh, tutorial hell or like, oh, you're, you're learning so much in a, this video walkthrough or you're reading these blogs or articles that might show you how to do something, but you don't get a chance to do it yourself. Like, it's cool. Hey, I'm, I'm getting these minuscule distilled and watered down exercises that sure present the concept to me. But as you mentioned, hey, you don't get like actual on the job experience that you might with just diving in uh and certifications can help hey land the job obviously education is a thing obviously your own portfolio and the practice and work that you do uh but absolutely agree with you you kind of kind of keep in mind when you know you want a career in this or you have the passion and you're looking for a vocation Get yourself out there and start to ask those questions, knock on doors, look out for those potential opportunities. Uh, and that's where the rubber hits the road. You might kind of dive into some of the other resources you use, you know, for someone who like doesn't even know where to start. Where did you really, you know, you mentioned, you know, you used some blocks in the past. What else did you use to really kind of teach yourself the important skills you needed? So I'll be honest, I have probably 
tinkered and played with a little one too many of those online war games. A lot of those <laughs> practice environments and sort of cyber ranges. Uh, and it's a long, long list. Uh, so when I was kind of first getting into this, trying to cut my teeth to learn some things, there was overthewire.org for getting into the Linux command line. There's also underthewire.org if folks are more interested in Windows PowerShell and system administration stuff. Uh, you've also got, hey, Pico CTF is one that I constantly recommend to folks because it's super beginner friendly, really approachable. It advertises itself, quote unquote, as for like middle school and high school students, but just to say this is super approachable. It is not by any means right. that's the only audience. It's just... <laughs> trying to hey make this hand holding and friendly uh you've got smash the stack you've got rop emporium if folks want to get into more binary exploitation there's obviously try hack me there's obviously hack the box there's uh, i could keep <laughs> running the laundry list and itemizing these but uh, we'll have to drop a maybe a link in show notes or anything to get some folks in the scene uh, absolutely and we'll definitely link quite a few of those platforms down there and you mentioned hack the box and they just so happen to be one of the sponsors and are donating to this video we are actually going to give away a couple annual silver annual hack the box subscriptions let's kind of talk about what hack the box is uh you know you've probably used it way more than i have i've used hack the box it is so much fun but uh do you mind kind of explaining what hack the box does absolutely so if folks listening in aren't familiar uh hack the box is one of those always on always accessible training platforms and uh, an online cyber range or war game where the player, you, could boot up a virtual machine, a really just a computer that gets somewhere out there on the internet, and it's a safe environment where you can act like the adversary. You can put your hacker hat on, you can do penetration testing, uh, and, and go on the offense. Hey, can I beat up this box? Can I find any vulnerabilities? Can I throw any exploits? And can I compromise this thing it's literally hack the box right so <laughs> <laughs> a ton of fun there's an immense learning and training value in it uh it's one of those that i really like into because there are great resources where you can learn in that tutorial or tutorial hell phase. Uh, but hack the box is like going to the gym, hack the box is hey, you know, lifting the heavy weights and trying to really sharpen your skills on this for training sake, reinforce and validate. I know my stuff because I can cut through this in a real, real environment. Awesome. And if you guys are interested in entering the drawing to win a annual silver membership to the hack the box Academy, there's a link down in the description and we're going to use the keyword Cali. So you're going to need the keyword Cali. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cali Linux is a version of Linux for specifically for hacking. And speaking of Cali Linux, I always curious, what is your favorite version? What is your favorite flavor distribution of Linux? Ooh, so for the longest time I ran Ubuntu. Uh it was a daily driver on my on my laptop, on my desktop. Uh now I am honestly, hey, just kind of using just virtual machines rather than having installed bare metal. Uh and I will be in Cali <laughs> whenever I'm doing some uh shady offensive work. Awesome. And uh, I, I can completely re relate. I have uh, like my work computer. I dual boot into Ubuntu because nice. uh, I just do so much with um, Linux based systems for my employer. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I'm kind of starting to go away from that a little bit. The whole du dual boot environment. Um, I have all my servers running Linux. And if I really need to do something in Linux, I kind of just be uh, uh, remote desktop into one of those, you know, SSH in and do it that way. But absolutely. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about what your the day to day life of someone in your position, a cybersecurity. I totally forgot your job title. I apologize. Oh, no worries. Uh, cybersecurity researcher. Is that what you call yourself? Yeah. 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 Uh, so let's talk about what it, a day in the life of a cybersecurity researcher is um, like. You know, what do you do on a day to day basis? Okay, uh, so a super quick context, uh, just for hey, my employer and, and what Huntress is. Uh, we're a software as a service. Hey, trying to offer managed security uh, as a security platform, looking for threat detection or preventing malware and malicious activity on uh, organizations and computers uh, for businesses and companies. Normally looking at small mid market businesses. Normally looking at MSPs. Ton of fun because there is certainly room for improvement 
moment in <laughs> the cybersecurity yeah. space within that ecosystem. Uh, so we'll get telemetry and insights and alerts when there are uh, hacker footholds. Okay, uh, how has malware gone on in the system? What can we do to analyze and respond to that, triage and investigate it, and get the bad people out? Uh, Thankfully, I get to jump on the keyboard and do some of that cool, fun, nerdy stuff with a lot of the analysts here and there. Uh, I also get to build out some of the functionality and features, just tweaking code and prototyping ideas for things we could add to our agent or to our product. Uh, and alongside it, I get to go, hey, research whatever new threats are out there or spread the word and notify people awesome. and tell people about this. One of the biggest cornerstones, I think, of what I do is outward education and, and, and public stuff. So talking to reporters when something is new across all the headlines or doing main stage presentations and sharing this out in blog posts and content. It's it's a weird mix in my mind between a certain sort of evangelist role while still being in the trenches, still getting to be on the front lines with folks cutting up malware and, and making hackers earn their access. <laughs> you really get the best of both worlds, it sounds like. You it's know, fun, you, yeah. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of times jobs in IT, you can kind of get siloed off into a very specific thing you know you're just the analyst or you're just writing reports or you know so on uh, but there are quite a few jobs out there like yours where you kind of get to do a little bit of everything and that's that's really where i think it can become fun um because you're constantly having to learn you're having to wear multiple hats um it really makes you know makes uh things uh interesting Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll admit I am very fortunate. Um, it, it, a real blessing. Hey, it, I guess it's startup environment, right? So you get to wear many hats and it's always action packed, something to do. But uh, having the, the YouTube blend and hey, creating content and hopefully having some charisma and energy to this thing. Uh, hey, you can talk about it and you can shine the spotlight on the awesome stuff that we do on the team and what's going on in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned YouTube. YouTube is a huge resource out there that is 100% free for people who want to start learning about cybersecurity. You mind kind of talking about what you do more specifically on your YouTube channel? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Uh, so the YouTube channel is a labor of love. It's it's absolutely a passion project. Uh, so for the longest time, I tried to showcase some programming tutorials of my own. Like, hey, here's how to cut some code up in Python or here's like Windows Batch or PowerShell, etc. Uh, and then when I got into the Capture the Flag scene, I started to showcase some of those CTF walkthroughs and write-ups where folks can learn from in a, in a hands-on challenge. That includes some of those war games. Hey, you try hack me. Hey, hack the box. Uh, as I got into my current role, I started to play a little bit more with malware analysis and, oh, some of those spooky, scary things that might end up on a device, uh, cutting back the layers and understanding how that all works and what happens on that dark web thing. I think we, the industry or the world <laughs> kind of, you know, adds a certain amount of mystique and, and it tries to make that some spooky thing. But if we demystify that and we go take a tour, what's uh, behind all these hidden onion sites, uh, understanding some of those cybercrime markets. So it's a lot of fun. I guess I try to do anything that is interesting that I like and I <laughs> think is cool to show other people. Awesome. Speaking of things you like, what is your favorite part about your job? Like what is what gets you up every morning? Ooh. I so I think it's interesting. Uh I Well, I'd I'd hope you think your job's interesting. <laughs> I mean, that, that makes it a lot better. <laughs> Obviously, I think a lot of the training that we do and the education leans us more red teamy, offensive, pen testing, bug bounty, etc. Uh which is cool and it's fun and it's sexy and that's why people like to jump into it but obviously my role and my job is a little bit more blue teamy like we're on the defense we're trying to protect and secure and lock things down uh that is a surprise i think for some folks like john you're not a pen tester it's like no oh. but it's really 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 fulfilling when we can share some threat intelligence or offer information that helps organizations and help gets them in a better secure spot than they were beforehand. When we're chasing some of the crazy stuff, vulnerabilities like, oh, Print Nightmare, Felina, Log4j, some ransomware attack, uh, it, it really makes an impact when we're helping those organizations and those people sleep better at night, 
because hey, we've got someone that's on the watch. We're, we've got their back. For people getting into the uh, this field, what do you feel is the biggest barrier to entry for people just trying to get started out, and how can they overcome that? The elephant in the room, right? Money is obviously a a certain barrier and roadblock. Uh, sometimes you look at the price tag for a lot of these certifications if folks are interested in them or educational training programs, uh, and that can be intimidating and bog you down, but I would charge and, and, and argue against that. There are so many resources out there available for free on the internet, giveaways that you're up to, hey, training videos out on YouTube or things that you can still get a chance to get yourself involved in and, and learn. Uh, so money is absolutely one of the biggest speed bumps, but hey, don't let it stop you. Time is another one. Like, oh man, I'm running around. I, I've got already ob- these obligations and things that I need to fulfill all the responsibilities in my life. And I feel you. I absolutely agree. Um, I think it's if you absolutely want to do this and it's a love and a passion, then it's something you'll wake up early for or you'll stay up late because it's just something you enjoy and you want to get better at. Uh, you, you find and you carve out time and you make time. And the last one, I, I know I'm rambling. I'm sorry, but if oh, I give like no, some keep on some three, you have so much great, great <laughs> information, you're a wealth of knowledge. A three pedestals here, right? If we're talking about time and money, there's the other one where your your biggest enemy is yourself, right? Where you're thinking like, man, I'm not good enough. Man, I'm seeing all these other incredible people doing fantastic stuff. Scrolling through Twitter, scrolling through LinkedIn, comparing yourself to other people. Like that's imposter syndrome and it's infuriating and annoying and will beat you down if you let it. Uh so, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to, to other people that are, are just sharing their highlight reel, all their successes one after the other. You got to be comparing yourself against yourself, against who you were yesterday, what you were up to, and how you can improve. Uh, it, I think that's the best way to, to fight out that imposter syndrome is to use it as motivation. Go learn something new and, and go play even more. Absolutely. So you were just talking about, you know, how uh, penetration testing and the red team kind of the, the sexy side of <laughs> IT or of cybersecurity. Um, but that breaks, makes up a small fraction of cybersecurity jobs. Um, and I don't want to say they're not important, but there is so many other job roles out there. Um, you know what? You know, everyone, I feel like everyone wants to get us getting into the field, wants to be a penetration tester yep. just because that's like, you know, it's what kind of the, you know, industry like shines a spotlight on, you know, Oh, that's the sexy role. That's the, that's the movie star, but there is a lot more other positions that are, I think a lot more rewarding. And I don't want to say more important because it, this penetration testing is super important, but on the same hand, the things you learn from penetration testing, you have, someone has to go and implement that. Totally. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about the other type of job roles that you kind of see on the field, um, and what's kind of in demand the most. Ooh, okay. I think obviously up there is is some of that that threat hunter side. Hey, you've, you're looking for forensic artifacts and incident response, trying to weed out the adversary uh, with that forensic analyst, right? If you're cutting through the memory of a compromised device, trying to see what files or things were available or recovering a hard drive, um, you go down those two different paths. Uh, there's obviously more of a sort of security engineer or reliability uh, folks that will determine, hey, how can we have a secure pipeline when we're pushing out infrastructure or code? That's very DevOps, right? But that's getting into some more of those cloud concepts and, and knowing, understanding the security implications with those. Uh, I, I'm trying to think even more, right? You got some web, applica- web application folks. I, I'd love to kind of pick your brain on that one here. What, what other ones are, are you thinking of? Uh, I mean, there is so many different options, um, you know, um, and, you know, from my opinion, from what I see is like red teams kind of make up like uh, a fourth of really the jobs I see out there. And three fourths of it is really like the blue team side. Um, you know, when an organization is hiring for positions, you know, it's expensive to hire people. And a lot of times they, you know, there's very few organizations that can actually 
afford to have their own on-site red team. Um, so I see a lot more blue team jobs, a lot more um, security analyst positions, a lot more of those kind of basic entry level jobs where the organization is trying to do everything they can, like the basic preliminary stuff. And then a lot of times they'll reach out to like a company like yours and contract out a little bit more high level stuff. So that's kind of what I see more in the field. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming from more of a networking background, you know, security is super important in my field, but you know, I, I leave that for people like you <laughs> out there, the, the experts, the people, you know, it, there's only so many hours in the day. I only can dedicate so much bandwidth to so many things. And at the end of the day, I got to, my most important thing is to make sure everything runs. Obviously it doesn't run if there's a security vulnerability and someone hacks into the system, but on the same hand, you know, I have all these other things I got to keep going. So absolutely. I would pitch if it's a, okay. Uh, I think the work that uh, like, what you do is absolutely invaluable and necessary uh, almost b before security, right? You are the most absolutely needed folk because when you think of any organization, like you think of it down the street, right at the corner, a mom and pop shop that sells ice cream or is a dentistry over on the side here or a school or they they need someone they need people they need a crew that is keeping things online and running the system and running the business uh and not always with security in mind and i just realized that's a reality it's not always what what us security professionals are screaming and shouting about when we say hey security comes first the truth is the business has to come first so you got to be running the show and hey we need the people to keep the lights on so whether that's in networking whether that's in just hey whatever traditional it help desk etc that has to be there so credit to you my Absol friend absolutely and you know well, i get the question a lot of time people ask me you know hey i'm interested in cybersecurity. i'm going to go for my security plus and all this and i'm like pump the brakes for a second like what experience do you have in the field because you can't protect the network if you don't understand how the network right. runs um you know and i think that's a really important part you know i a lot of people at least what i tell them is hey you're looking to get into cybersecurity. that's an awesome field go get a networking certification first figure out you know go study networking because you need to know how the network works you have to have those fundamental skills so um for someone who's completely novice i'm going to say hey start with something simple like the a plus figure out how your computer runs and how do we use linux and then dive into that kind of skills because you need to like it's like building a house you have to have a good foundation you know foundational knowledge set to start you know building the walls and putting the door on it to keep the bad guys out to me like that's the part of cybersecurity that actually interests me the most is like the forensics like it's not necessarily like you know there, there you can kind of break it down into you know your blue teams you're trying to prevent the people from breaking in and then you have your red team that's trying to figure out how to get in and the vulnerabilities but then there's also like the forensic side where okay the bad guy got in that sucks let's figure out how they got in let's make sure they they're not in there anymore and then we can keep them from getting in again in the future kind of I, I know you kind of talked about that a little bit but let's dive a little bit more in because i think that's not talked about a lot and i find that super fascinating it's like a crime scene investigator in a sense oh totally and that's a really nice way to put it because you are you are at the scene of the crime and you're kind of acting as a detective here uh and that means you sort of have to get in the mind of, of the adversary right and understand yeah. how they work or what they decide to do and when and why uh you need to know how they operate and you, you, people say these words uh tactics techniques and procedures or ttps and that's like the style that a cyber criminal will hack someone <laughs> like the tools that they use what they do and their procedures their workflow and it's a it's an it's a certain trademark, right, for APT or advanced persistent threat groups and stuff that the threat intelligence community likes to track and try to monitor. Uh, so it's very, very cool because I think it bridges and blends what we tend to think of like, oh, for a red team or for a blue team. Well, you are a better defender if you know how the offense works, which is like, which is why I like to pivot and swivel between some of that. Hey, okay traditional yeah. pen testing and yeah threat hunting instant response and forensics 
Yeah, and definitely recently the the term purple team is starting to become more and more popular. Oh, yeah. And that's why I think you're I think that's really kind of the future a lot of organizations are going towards. Um, you know, they have someone who can definitely do the red team stuff, but also t- take care of, you know, not just figuring out how to get in, but then applying the patches to the systems after the fact. Totally. Um, so definitely and and that that really, I think, leads to more job opportunities because you are able to pivot. Um, you know, if something ever happens, you have not just one part of the equation, you have both sides of the equation then. And that makes yourself even more valuable in this uh, job market. And I'll add just a little bit more to that, if that's A-OK. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. When when something hits the fan, right, when there are news and headlines and everyone's screaming like a chicken with their head cut off, like, oh, there's a new vulnerability, there's a new zero day, there's a new exploit. Uh, what adds some value and you can kind of bring to the table is like, okay, if, if you act and put on your hacker hat, right, uh, let's go look at this exploit. Let's go learn how is this done? And can it be recreated? Can it be tinkered and, and, and twisted just in one way to make this kind of useful to like, okay, let, let's make a small proof of concept that other organizations or teams can use for their own benefit. I know that sounds weird when you think, oh, here's just a commoditized weapon or a, a cyber crime, but you use that for detection engineering. Like, okay, how can I find what artifacts and fingerprints this leaves behind? Oh, I can use that for patch validation. How can I make sure that we are really immune to this? I can use this for awareness. I can tell my boss. I can show, I can demonstrate the impact of this. Uh, I think there are a whole lot of fun, edgy, (laughs) and spicy conversations on the, okay, can of worms and morality of offensive tooling, right? But the most folks that I talk to, it's sort of like, there's a net positive when we break down those walls and we can share that education uh, because it's getting more information and more valuable knowledge to more people. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, One thing I kind of want to talk about, I kind of interested on your take on it. Um, A lot of times uh, there's a vulnerability that gets discovered. Um, Let's use log four J for instance. For sure. And I'm not saying log four J I'm not trying to downplay it at all, but I feel like that vulnerability was really um, overhyped almost on the news. Uh, It just seemed like everyone was like running around. Like you said, with chicken, chicken with their head (laughs) cut off, the sky is falling. You know, this is the end of, this is the apocalypse. And I'm not saying that log four J wasn't bad. It was definitely pretty nasty, but I feel like it got a little bit more attention than normal. Uh, How do you handle those situations where you have, like the upper management that really doesn't understand vulnerabilities. They're like, they come, and they come marching into your office at, you know, first thing in the morning, like log four J, we need to fix this. You know, we need to patch ourselves. Here's money. Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you handle those situations? Hmm. Okay. There are a couple of different perspectives. I think that are, that are fun to, to dance <laughs> with. Uh, I'll, I'll try to do mine first and then I'll try to do, Hey, that I know that super cool. one you were bringing in, uh, cause for us and, and for me uh, over at where I am for my own day job, we sort of look at, okay, when people are sending the alarm bells and the whistles and sirens are going off like, Oh, new vulnerability log for J sky's falling. Uh, when we want to act as a messenger and try to again, spread that knowledge, are we adding to the noise? Are we continuing to the problem of overhyping this thing up? So we try to be a little selective and chase ambulances that make sense and that, okay, there's a lot of potential damage that could be done here. It affects all versions of Windows or it affects however many versions of code written with this language and library. So we sort of have to figure out what is the associated risk. Uh, And then we'll decide whether we want to blow the whistle and scream about this uh, alongside or not. Uh, Log4j, hey, I was pretty cool to be in the trenches. We put together some testing tools. I made a stupid video in Minecraft about it. Uh, But (laughs) (laughs) to your point, on the other perspective, okay, what if you're this employee and you've got managers screaming and telling you, like, look, we need to get up at arms in this. Uh, You and the organization, in my mind, needs to know your own threat model and again assessing the risk uh and that comes down to your vantage point of hey we need to know the network we need to know the environment we need the assets applications inventory what's software is running what version what's applicable and where uh 
That is hard to do. I'll admit that. That requires a lot of documentation and configuration change management. But that's when you have the the people screaming and, and, and uh, cramming down your throat. Hey, we need to do something. You can be a little bit better armed for that conversation. Uh, and have the temperament that like, look, this is another vulnerability. It's, it's, and it's just that it's just another vulnerability. We're going to see more. This is a treadmill that we're on. Uh, it's going to happen again. And we just need to know, okay, what can we do to protect against it? And then let's get back to business and let's go fight the next thing. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, I'll admit, but I no, think that's the closest that's, thing. <laughs> no, that that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, because a lot of people, you know, when they have that executive in their office, they really don't know how to react. There's, you know, there's all that like, ooh, this is the big boss. I better not say the wrong thing. Yeah. But having that mindset, having that in the back of your mind already and knowing your response is definitely useful to have. So absolutely. Um so if people really want to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing or, you know, have any questions for you, where's the best resources for people to get a hold of you? Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. So you can totally find me online. Uh, pretty easy to track down. I guess I'm a, a walking docs, really. <laughs> uh, my name is John Hammond and you can find me there on YouTube. You can find me with that on Twitter. I think there's an underscore John Hammond, uh, LinkedIn just as well. I have a silly discord server, uh, but you can track me down with, with the red hair, uh, and just my name. So <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Well, well, we're definitely going to link to your YouTube channel and some other of your resources down in the video description. So I really, I really recommend anyone watching this, go check out his YouTube channel at least. And, uh, you have so much cool, you know, information over there. Um, Thank you. Even if you're not totally into cybersecurity, um, there, you still cover great topics that I think anyone should be aware about. Um, you know, um, I'm very much in the opinion of cybersecurity isn't just the job of people that work in security. It's really everyone's responsibility. Um, you know, you, you talk about um, in some of your videos, you know, the weakest link in cybersecurity is the human being. Um, and the human firewall is kind of sometimes the most important skill, you know, the most valuable resource to an organization. So, yeah, I think uh, it's all about education and just being aware, knowing what's on the horizon. So. Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And until next time, take it easy. Thank you.